Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Nayan Chanda, who is Director of Publications at the Yale Center for the Study of Globalization, and he is an editor at large with the Far Eastern Economic Review. He's the author of numerous books, uh, including Brother Enemy, The War After the War, and he's also the co-author and contributor to 10 other books on war, conflict, reconstruction, and foreign policy. Nayan, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Tell us a little about your background. Where were you born and raised? I was born in India, and I did my postgraduate studies uh, in India, and then I continued doing postgraduate studies in international relations in uh, Sorbonne in Paris. And uh, from there, I moved to journalism. To journalism. And, and let's talk a little about your early years. How, how do you think your parents shaped your character in retrospect? I think, uh, as is true of uh, almost every child, parents did have a tremendous influence. My father um, is a teacher. He, he, all his life he was a teacher, and he was a historian by training. And so he, and he was also an uh, extremely learned man. He wrote about 25 books on various subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, and so his uh, library and his interest in variety of subjects, from ornithology to history, mm. uh, was kind of very inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I followed his footsteps by taking measuring in history. So mm -hmm. uh, certainly he had a great influence on me. And what about your mother? Mother was always a very self-effacing person who looked after our welfare, but quietly, mm -hmm. and had a very strong character. Very and and why, why did you choose journalism, do you think? You wanted to be exposed to the world and travel No, places? I think journalism was um, essentially, I was studying history, as recent history, especially in the 70s, when the Vietnam War was at its height, I was very curious to find out why the Americans are fighting this war mm -hmm. thousands of miles away from the home. And studying history, trying to understand why this is happening. And that led me to think it may be perhaps much more interesting to see history being made mm -hmm. in front of your eyes and have a front row in the in the room where history is being made, rather than write, read about it in a library years mm -hmm. later. And, and, and were, you, were you a student at the time of the Vietnam War? Yeah, yeah. I, was, uh, I was a postgraduate student, yeah. Did, did you have attitudes toward U.S. policy and the conduct of the war? I yes. mean, were you, you yeah. anti-war? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was uh, appalled by the war, yeah. I, you know, because what we saw on images and, and articles that I read one saw only the suffering and destruction. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of mystifying to me as to why this could be happening. And so were you at the Sorbonne in the 60s? or No, no. no. In the early, early 70s. In the early 70s. 71 to 74. 71 to 74, okay. Yeah. So, so uh, now that you've been a journalist and a very successful journalist for quite a while, what, what does it take to be a journalist? I mean, what, what, are, the, what are the skills that make this work doable? I think the most important skill or quality you need is curiosity. You have to be really curious about yeah. things, wanting to find out why mm -hmm. and how and who. And, uh, and in order to do that, you do have to have a background in history. I think especially political journalism, you simply cannot do without a historical context. Mm -hmm. understanding the context in which things are happening. So I think uh, my um, uh, measuring in history and continuing the research in history uh, was uh, very helpful to me. Now your, your, your uh, uh, beat, so to speak, has really been the world in Asia. And so, so I guess that, that means that uh, your preparing through history uh, uh, requires a lot of different kinds of reading, moving beyond kind of national histories mm -hmm. of what is happening. Uh, is that the case? Yeah, I think uh, it's a history not only of one particular country, but uh, history of the neighboring countries, mm -hmm. understanding interrelationship, 
and of course reading uh, politics, uh, sociology, economics, because all this uh, play a role mm -hmm. in shaping events. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was working on a thesis in Sorbonne on the domestic roots of Cambodian foreign policy mm -hmm. under Prince Sihanouk. That was mm -hmm. the subject of my dissertation. When the Forest Economic Review in 1974 offered me and the job of the Indochina correspondent of the magazine based mm. in Saigon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had written some freelance articles for the magazine before that, and I could not resist the temptation mm -hmm. of this, uh, this job because Vietnam War officially had ended because Paris Peace Accord was signed in 73. Mm -hmm. Vietnam, US troops have withdrawn, but the war was still continuing. And uh, I arrived there just when the war really reaching is the last stage. Mm -hmm. That is the Vietnam War. Vietnam yeah. War. Yeah. And so 1975, April 30th, 1975, when the North Vietnamese tanks entered the palace in Saigon, ending the war, mm -hmm. as uh, a fortunate uh, journalist would have it, I was in Saigon. I had decided to stay on in Saigon. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Americans uh, pulled out, and journalists mostly pulled out, and I had decided to stay on. Mm -hmm. I forced my wife to leave, and my newly married wife, mm -hmm. and I stayed on in Saigon to watch the last act of the drama. Mm -hmm. And Reuters News Agency, which had basically sent out their own staff because they were concerned about the safety, mm -hmm. but since I had decided to stay on, they asked me whether I would file for them as well. Mm -hmm. So I was also filing for Reuters News Agency, and Reuters' office was just diagonally across from the presidential palace. I see, I see. And so at 11.30, the morning of April 30th, I was writing a story about the American embassy being looted after its last helicopter left mm -hmm. and saying that the end seems to be near. I hear a huge sound. I look through the open door and I see a tank crossing mm -hmm. the frame of the door mm -hmm. and at the back of the tank from the antenna hanging a red flag mm -hmm. and I said wow they're already here so I rushed out to take pictures of the can tank and uh, filed a one sentence flash to Reuters about the war being over. So so your your dream was fulfilled just as you started. I mean Absolutely. this was a, a turning point in yeah, in yeah, history. Yeah. And 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 so what were your what were your feelings at that moment? I mean, on the one hand you must be terribly excited about the opportunity, but then I guess awed by uh, the the fact that you are uh, uh, an eye for the for the yeah. rest of the world in yeah. a way. Yeah, it was it was a it's a truly a tremendous responsibility I felt because, mm -hmm. uh, of course, the the telex link uh, was cut within half an hour. Mm -hmm. But after a week, they restored a cable link, mm -hmm. no longer telex, but we can write stories and give it to the post office, cable office. Mm -hmm. And so whatever I filed for Reuters, I could hear that in the evening on BBC Bulletin because that was the only story they're getting I out see, of Saigon. So, <laughs> were you, so were you the only reporter left? No, no. Just there, were about, yeah, there were others. About 50 so altogether the, journalists, yeah, mostly right. Japanese, few Americans, yeah. European. Yeah. And, 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 and what, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, this is a good way to cut into this role of journalist because, it, so you have these emotions, you know, this awe, uh, a witness to history, but then you've got to put it all down in words, right? Yeah. I mean, so, so that's, a, that's a whole other set of problems. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, do you, do you have to struggle with the words uh, beyond this short sentence announcing what had happened or, or yes, what? Yes, I think the, um, the struggle really was was to decide which is the most important uh, fact that I need to tell because I have a budget. Mm -hmm. You could send only one story a day. Yeah. And what was I going to tell the world about mm -hmm. what's happening in Vietnam under mm -hmm. the communist uh, mm -hmm. rule? And uh, so selecting, there are so many things happening around you. Mm -hmm. And finding the most important a salient point that perhaps tells a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And what, so what did you choose? What was, do you remember what that, that story or the stories that you filed? Yeah, I, I think uh, was the, the sense of relief uh, rather than celebration. Mm -hmm. Because Saigon population generally were terrified mm -hmm. that the communists are coming and they would tear out their nails, mm -hmm. polish nails of bar girls, and mm -hmm. cut the long hairs of the hippie youth and mm -hmm. uh, arrest all the old regime people. Mm -hmm. And initially, the behavior was extremely exemplary. Mm -hmm. They were kind of shy country bumpkins wearing baggy green uniform, very polite, and um, they would look at a little compass to find out where they are without asking anybody, hmm. how do I get there? They were mm -hmm. so shy to ask anybody. Mm -hmm. This is the North Vietnamese. North Vietnamese, yeah, yeah. yes. And so the people initially were terrified of these people, and then they became uh, friendly and then almost uh, kind of mocking that these people are really illiterate country bumpkins. We can mm -hmm. make fun of them. So you'll see people trying to sell them uh, wristwatches. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see people holding a glass of water, putting a wristwatch in it. Mm -hmm. And North Vietnamese soldiers are watching with amazement that the hand is still moving underwater. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they would sell this stuff at a high price mm -hmm. to these people who have never seen a waterproof wristwatch. Mm -hmm. you know? And so the Saigonese returned to their old tricks of <laughs> being, uh, being very... Um, Taking advantage of taking the bumpkins. Advantage, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I think the reaction, the changing reaction of Saigon population toward the victors mm -hmm. was one story. And then how the government, new government was trying to establish its control, mm -hmm. what kind of laws, regulations they're passing, and slowly but in a methodical way they took control. And it mm -hmm. was quite amazing to see how, how they did it without any violence. Mm -hmm. Then of course they started asking people to come to report for a weeks or maybe a few days of re-education, they call it. Mm -hmm. And many of the former generals and s officials uh, dis disappear for years. Mm -hmm. So they were taken on a false sort of promise that this is just going to be a week of study of Marxist, mm -hmm. Marxism, Leninism, Ho Chi Minh's thought, mm -hmm. and you'll be back with your family. Mm -hmm. And uh, by doing this, they avoided any resistance. Mm -hmm. Nobody protested. They said, well, you know, this is, yeah. this is a small thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they, this is a very astute and kind of insidious way they yeah. established the control. Now, what uh, I'm curious about your thoughts at this time, both on the one hand uh, being uh, critical, as you said, of American policies there, but on, on the other hand, coming from a, a free society like India and being aware of, of the implications. I mean, talk a little about those uh, ambivalences and yeah. how they affected your writing about what you were witnessing. Yeah, I think uh, the uh, experience of living under a communist regime mm -hmm. was very salutary. Yeah. Because um, when you are looking at the war from just from outside, you see big power just expending a huge amount of munition mm -hmm. on a poor countryside, common people, poor people being hurt. And so the ideological aspect of the war that what the communists were trying to do mm -hmm. was not evident mm -hmm. uh, from outside. Yeah. And uh, obviously there are many books. If I had read those books, I would have perhaps been more aware of those. Yeah. But living in Vietnam mm -hmm. those time, and eventually going back to Vietnam, many, many trips I've made to communist Vietnam, seeing how the society is regimented, how the party controls your life, Mm -hmm. um, gave you a different dimension. So I think the kind of education you give, get by being in a society like this is uh, far more interesting mm -hmm. than reading it in a book. You know? Yeah.
Yeah. Now, you went on then uh, in the next few years uh, to follow the Cambodia story. Yeah. And, and really, that's a, 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 a great human tragedy uh, uh, which might uh, have a subtitle of spillover from the Vietnam War. Uh, tell us a little about that and, and uh, the, the forces that were let loose there internally and actually the involvement of external actors. Yeah, the Cambodian conflict, uh, Cambodia have been going uh, to Cambodia since 1971. I have made periodic trips there to collect material for my thesis. And I was in Phnom Penh just about 10 days before the collapse. And somehow I decided that Phnom Penh may not be the place to wait for the victors to come. Mm -hmm. uh, the stories you have been hearing, the way the Khmer Rouge have behaved with uh, foreigners. Uh, so I decided to wait for the inevitable in Saigon rather than in Phnom Penh. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, I think I made the right decision. Otherwise, yeah, right. I would have ended up in the French embassy compound like with other journalists as mm -hmm. prisoner of the Khmer Rouge. And so I went back to Cambodia after 75 for the first time in 1979, a few uh, months after the Pol Pot regime was overthrown. And uh, Phnom Penh was still a ghost town. It was Vietnamese troops were guarding the entrance to the city and still searching for hidden cache of arms and maybe hidden Khmer Rouge. And it was a extremely eerie experience to walk down the main highway boulevard of Phnom Penh in the middle of the day and hear your footsteps echoing from the walls. Mm. Just totally devoid of life. Mm -hmm. Trees have grown on the pavement. You go and walk into a home. The everything is lying there as it was left behind by the occupants five years ago. Mm. Um, table, cutlery on the table. A real uh, ghost town. Ghost town. Yeah. And, and since then I've seen this town come back to life. Mm -hmm. And then seen the evidence of what the commanders did to their country. It was just absolutely mind-blowing mm -hmm. to see this huge, huge open field of, um, of mass graves, which were, mm -hmm. again, it should opened up by the survivors to find gold. It was just uh, amazing that people who had gold teeth or maybe some ring or some ornament on their body when they killed. So the survivors, four years later, they go and open up, dig up the, hmm. the graves to look for gold with which they can go and buy something in Thailand to mm -hmm. survive. So uh, Cambodia was again a lesson in the uh, the cruelty that human beings capable of inflicting on another human being mm -hmm. and also the spirit and resilience of human soul mm -hmm. uh, now and, and uh, let's clarify that a little is it is it the the that the, the Cambodians in a way were at the bottom of the rung in, in terms of priorities vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam and that these kind of forces of madness of, of uh, communist dogma gone mad were unleashed basically on the countryside or is that too simplistic? I think it is a bit too simplistic. The, the Khmer society mm -hmm. uh, it was basically a rural society and, and the peasants were um, they all, nobody ha was landless really, mm -hmm. there's enough land, but it was not producing enough and if family was large they couldn't feed the entire population and kids will go to town and Sihanouk uh, developed education system very well and that was in some ways his undoing mm -hmm. because there was education where you produce a lot of graduates but there is no service industry Mm -hmm. to absorb these graduates. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of graduates pulling rickshaws mm -hmm. to carry passengers. And that development led to this huge unrest among youth. Mm -hmm. And the Khmer Rouge leaders really came from the middle class intellectuals mm -hmm. who wanted to change this uh, feudal monarchy and system where uh, the Courtesans and, uh, and aristocrats lived well and peasants suffered and the urban middle class were jobless. Mm -hmm. So there was this opposition growing and the Vietnamese communists 
uh, used Cambodia as their sanctuary during the Vietnam War. And when Nixon decided to invade Cambodia to clear out the sanctuaries, mm -hmm. he actually did the Vietnam is a great service mm -hmm. because he then turned Cambodia against the war against the United States. Mm -hmm. And the Vietnamese troops could go much deeper inside the country. And the Khmer Rouge were then backed by the Vietnamese. They were trained mm -hmm. and armed. And the Khmer Rouge resistance started growing with the help of the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when uh, the Vietnam War was over uh, and this, the, the consequences of what you just described were being felt, uh, uh, the, the, the great powers still took an interest in what happened there. T tell us a little about how the dynamic of uh, Cambodian uh, political and social life was affected by the, the conflicting interests of China, the United States, and others. Mm -hmm. When the Vietnam War ended in 1975, um, the Vietnamese uh, communists were jubilant and they, f they were actually they had a very arrogant attitude toward the rest of Southeast Asia because they were the victors who defeated the Americans. And they were going to be the leader of Southeast Asia. And uh, Russians were, they saw the opportunity of getting a foothold in Southeast Asia and this, they supported the Vietnamese and, and Chinese at this stage, Chinese have been very suspicious of the Vietnamese for a long time, which, with whom they had a long historical conflict. So the Chinese were really the most upset country after the Vietnamese victory. Mm -hmm. So the China-Vietnam conflict, which has been dormant, sort of started flaring up. And the Chinese supported the Khmer Rouge to oppose the Vietnamese. And so the Khmer Rouge were given massive amount of economic and military assistance by the Chinese. And the Russians started giving Vietnam massive uh, economic and military assistance. And by 1978, they signed a treaty which allowed the Viet Russians to have a naval base in Cameron Bay. Mm -hmm. And in the meanwhile, the Chinese have sent tens of thousands of advisors to Cambodia and started training the Cambodian army. So the Cambodia uh, became a proxy for the Chinese to attack the Vietnamese from the southwest. Mm -hmm. And so this conflict, which where the Chinese and Ru Russians were on two sides of this conflict, and the United States under Jimmy Carter took the position that Cambodians were the worst human rights violators, so the U.S. should have nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. but the uh, U.S. also wanted to normalize relations with China. And so then came a time in 1978 when China and Vietnam both were pressing ahead to wanting to have normalized, normal relations with, with the United States. And Brzezinski, Zbigniew Brzezinski was the national security advisor of Carter. And he was uh, totally against the Vietnamese because Vietnamese were seen as, as Russian stooges. Mm -hmm. And so under Brzezinski's uh, pressure and influence, I think Carter's lined up with the Chinese. And so although the United States did not take part directly, it turned out that the Chinese-Cambodian attack on the Vietnamese had the implicit backing of the United States. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the Chinese invaded Vietnam in February 1979, just a few weeks after Deng Xiaoping, then China's supreme leader, had visited Washington. And while in Washington, he told Jimmy Carter and Brzezinski that I'm going to teach Vietnamese a lesson. Mm -hmm. They have become very arrogant by inviting, invading Cambodia. And basically, Carter said, yes, I understand, but keep it, keep it uh, short. You know, mm -hmm. don't, don't carry on the lesson too long. And so the Vietnamese-Chinese conflict uh, came to a head in 1979. So from 79 until the signing of the Cambodia Accord in 1991, mm -hmm. Cambodia had become this next theater of war, where the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and overthrew the Khmer Rouge government in 79. And the Khmer Rouge were then backed by the Chinese and ASEAN and implicitly by the United States to resist the Vietnamese 
occupation of Cambodia. So the Cambodia was in the civil war, which lasted until 1991, when there was an international agreement mm -hmm. to bring it to a close. And what, what changed the, the situation and led to the agreement? Essentially, the collapse of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. removed the biggest backer of the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And Vietnamese were already isolated by the United States and ASEAN, the Association of South Asian Countries, the organization which played a very active role in opposing the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia. Mm -hmm. So the, on the one hand, Vietnamese lost their main support mm -hmm. with the collapse of Soviet Union, and Soviet Union has withdrawn from Afghanistan by then, and Soviet Union was basically telling the Vietnamese, if game is over, you should withdraw from mm -hmm. Cambodia. And uh, so the, and then of course the 1989 Tiananmen massacre put the Chinese in the doghouse. Mm -hmm. The Chinese saw an opportunity of emerging from that isolation by playing a statesman-like role. So they mm -hmm. took a more active role mm -hmm. and pressured the Khmer Rouge to come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. So both this collapse of Soviet Union and Chinese isolation both played a role in bringing about a settlement. Mm -hmm. So, so in a way, these these places like Cambodia and maybe Afghanistan really, uh, uh, as they become an object of the big power game, uh, in the short term, really suffer. Mm -hmm. But then things settle out in some yeah. way, often because the interests of the great powers change. Changes, yes. Yeah. And that has been a major, major factor. Yeah. But how these countries have been um, sort of. Um, the playpen, a cockpit of a struggle between uh, powers who, who have very little interest either in the people or resources of that country. Cambodia has really nothing that anybody wants. Yeah. Yet that country suffered terribly. Mm -hmm. The last two decades. And and what uh, are there? Uh, at, at, we've entered a new phase of this post Cold War world. I, I don't even know if that term is applicable anymore. With uh, the events of of uh, nine eleven, uh, uh, what 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 should we be looking at and concerned about that that gives us uh, an insight uh, into the long term issues? involved here. Uh, now, uh, because of uh, the actions of Al-Qaeda, there's a great deal of interest now, for example, in this country about the Pakistan-India uh, conflict, uh, about the danger posed uh, in uh, Kashmir, the danger, uh, the added danger because of nuclear weapons. Uh, with this uh, perspective that you've developed as a journalist, really sort of seeing kind of the long-term problem and the short-term problem. Help help us uh, uh, sort out this geopolitical situation uh, in South Asia today. Well, uh, the I look at Southeast Asia as the unfinished problem of decolonization. Mm -hmm. uh, let me back up and say what I mean is that India and Pakistan was created as independent states when the British uh, left the Indian subcontinent. India was uh, periodically a unified state under different rulers, but India at the current shape was unified like that only by the British. Mm -hmm. And so the borders that the Indians, the Indian and the British drew of India and Pakistan and Pakistan was supposed to be the home of the Muslims in the Indian subcontinent, mm -hmm. which led to enormous bloodshed, as you know, in 1947, uh, when Hindus killed Muslims in India, and Muslims killed Hindus in Pakistan, and there was a migration mm -hmm. across the border by uh, these um, two communities. But in case of India, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru was the leader and he was a very modern person. He, he believed secularism and democracy would be the binding glue for the country because India had 18 different languages, all the major religions in the world, and India could not be based on either religious identity 
or one lingu linguistic identity. Mm -hmm. So multiracial, pluralistic, and secular society was the model. And that allowed India to actually, despite its poverty and uh, backwardness, survive this last 50 odd years. But Pakistan identity was based on Islam. Mm -hmm. And that identity received a big blow in 1971 when East Pakistan decided to secede and become Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So the fact that these people were also Muslims, but they didn't want to stay within Pakistan and, and have their own state was a big blow to the ideology that was dominating, ruling Pakistan. And that made it even more imperative for Pakistan to stake their claim on the Islamic population in Kashmir Valley. Mm -hmm. Because uh, hmm. these people across the border are our Muslim brothers, and they are being oppressed by the Hindu India. And so in order to, if you, Pakistan will not be complete as a nation mm -hmm. unless we recover these Muslim brothers from Indian clutches. Mm -hmm. And so the recovering Kashmir became a more important national objective. And even, and even you know, when the Pakistani soldiers take the oath after joining the army, the oath includes the language which says we will recover uh, Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And so then that became a major element of conflict in the subcontinent. And Chinese saw the uh, India is a is a large country with a population and economic resources and and manpower is bound to emerge as a rival of China. Mm -hmm. So by supporting Pakistan to keep India off balance was a, a was a policy that appealed to them. So right from the beginning, Chinese have been supporting Pakistan. Uh, against India. And so that created a different dynamic in the region. So Chinese, uh, India s had its own nuclear explosion in 1974. China started helping Pakistan to build its own bomb. And then India exploded its first bomb in 1998. Mm -hmm. It was followed by Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And then Chinese have given Pakistan uh, missiles and sold the missile technology. Chinese, Pakistanis also have got missile technology from North Korea. So basically, these two countries have developed now nuclear weapon and missiles. Mm -hmm. And the issue at stake is still Kashmir. Mm -hmm. and, and underneath that is this question of a national identity. Mm -hmm. India would cannot accept that a part of its, its, its state of Kashmir should be given away to in Pakistan because the population there are Muslim. India has a population larger than Pakistan, Muslim population, mm -hmm. and they are spread all over the India. Mm -hmm. So if you accept the idea mm -hmm. that because they are majority in a state, they should secede, then mm -hmm. India will break apart. There will mm -hmm. be state where Islamic population may be majority. Should that state then secede from Indian mm -hmm. Union? Mm -hmm. So India's secular, secularism and democratic principle mm -hmm. would, would receive a body blow if India accepted that. Mm -hmm. So that has now become the absolutely most difficult problem to resolve between Pakistan and India. And uh, I guess the, the emergence in the 90s uh, of uh, the Al-Qaeda network uh, ultimately by the end of the decade operating out of Afghanistan and maybe having its roots in American uh, support for the anti-Russian uh, uh, Soviet struggle in Afghanistan adds even more fuel to this fire. Tell yes. us a little about that. Yes, I think the Afghanistan is also the same story. Afghan, Afghanistan was created by the British, the current border. Uh, it was um, it's an artificial border. Afghanistan has Pashtun people who are over 40% of the population. Then you have uh, Tajiks and Hazaras. And um, this minority population, they 
were ruled by king who had a loose arrangement. There's a, a tribal a congress called Loi Jigra, which met annually, and the king decided, discussed with these tribal chieftains as to what policies uh, the government should pursue. And people basically ruled themselves. The, mm -hmm. the government control was very minimal. Mm -hmm. But then um, King's cousin wanted to grab power, and he plotted, and he called, he overthrew the king and called Afghanistan a republic. Mm -hmm. Now, democracy cannot create out of thin air. The population, economic development was not ready to have democracy. So basically, the country fell apart. Then emerged the Communist Party, tried to create a socialist identity for Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They failed miserably. Russians came in, in support of the Communist Party, to take control of Afghanistan, which led the Americans to come in mm -hmm. and support the different As Afghan groups to oppose mm -hmm. the Russian invasion. And Pakistan was, of course, extremely keen to have a state, client state on its border in Afghanistan. So Pakistan intelligence services backed by the United States created Mujahideen and eventually Taliban. Mm -hmm. Taliban means students, and these students were trained in Muslim schools, madrasas in Pakistan, and they were indoctrinated with one ideology, that is a Quran, and creating a pure Islamic state in, uh, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And that state, uh, which is an Islamic state whose purpose is essentially to advance Islam, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And so that provided the real host for Al-Qaeda network. Mm -hmm. And Al-Qaeda network tried training people uh, for an internationalist operation. Uh, terrorists were trained in camps in Afghanistan to be sent to Kashmir. So violence levels in Kashmir shot up in the last five, six years mm -hmm. because the Pakistani groups as well as um, Sudanese, Palestinians, even Chechens were trained and sent to Kashmir to blow up buildings and kill people, mm -hmm. to basically force the Indian army to abandon Kashmir to the Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. And so this brings us to the current situation when the Indian government uh, heard the news of what happened in New York, there was, of course, in a, at a popular level, great sympathy and anger mm -hmm. at this uh, tragedy, because after all, many Indians died in there. Well, 250 Indians, mm -hmm. people of Indian origin, died in the World Trade Center. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, Indian government saw, finally, the Americans would realize what we have been going through mm -hmm. in Kashmir over the years. Mm -hmm. And maybe Americans will now cooperate with us mm -hmm. against the terrorists. Because Indian government has been pressuring, pressuring US for many years mm -hmm. to declare Pakistan a terrorist state for supporting these groups based in Pakistan. And US didn't do that. And so the Indians now expect the United States to carry its war on terrorism beyond Afghanistan mm -hmm. and an attack on the um, Pakistan-based Islamic groups which operate in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. Now, you, in your recent writings, you have been very focused on uh, the, uh, uh, the possibilities of uh, 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 nuclear weapons being used intentionally or unintentionally by the states uh, in the region, uh, uh, especially Pakistan, because of uh, the uh, security, uh, because of the incapacity of any kind of international regime uh, to monitor, and because of the, the weakness mm -hmm. uh, of the regimes. Uh, 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 what, what is the way out of this situation, given the present volatility? Yeah, I think there is, uh, uh, this is a problem which doesn't have any easy answer. Mm -hmm. A problem is very acute. Uh, Pakistan has <coughs> about, about uh, almost 10 different institutions, research labs, as well as plants where nuclear material is produced and nuclear weapon assembled. And 
Pakistan has been, of course, extremely, you know, the whole thing is done in secrecy, and even the United States officials uh, tell you that they know very little as to what exactly Pakistanis have done and how many weapons do they have. Mm -hmm. The estimate is that they have about 25 uh, warheads which can be put on a missile or carried by aircraft. Mm -hmm. And these weapons are kept apparently in different locations with the nuclear material and the mechanical part kept separately according to the Pakistanis mm -hmm. in order to maintain safety. But one doesn't know for sure that is the case. And secondly, the fact that Pakistani uh, scientists, Pakistani intelligence services have had many supporters of Islamic fundamentalists, supporters of Taliban, mm -hmm. makes the situation even more dicey. Mm -hmm. because one doesn't know whether these people's loyalty is towards the state of Pakistan, its security, or is towards an Islamic uh, notion of uh, going after the infidels and mm -hmm. perhaps providing them with the ultimate weapon. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Al-Qaeda has been trying to obtain nuclear weapon, that is pretty well uh, documented in the court case in New York, it came out that that has been there on the targets. So in view of Al-Qaeda's desire to obtain nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. in view of the fact that Taliban has a lot of sympathizers in, in the Pakistan establishment, mm -hmm. the fear is that there could be pilferage mm -hmm. of nuclear material from mm -hmm. these plants. The other fear is that if the American uh, war in Afghanistan drags on, mm -hmm. and more and more civilians are killed in uh, in, um, in these bombing raids. The emotion in Pakistan is is already very high. Mm -hmm. It could reach a point where uh, army may be called upon to suppress the people, or army might turn their back on this order, and might, with the help of the Islamic uh, fundamentalist elements in the security and uh, intelligence services mount a coup. Mm -hmm. And if these extremists take over the government, then the, all the nuclear instructions fall in their hand. Mm -hmm. That is also an option or a mm -hmm. scenario which uh, frightens uh, people in Washington. And, and what, what do you think would be the reaction first uh, of the Indians and then of the United States if that were to happen? Would, would one or the other go in uh, to try to take possessions of the weapons before they fell the, into the wrong hands? This is what people speculate. Now, uh, there has been a time in 1991, immediately after the Israelis went and bombed Iraqi mm -hmm. reactor, Indian Air Force actually did a study mm -hmm. as to whether they could do something about the Pakistani nuclear mm -hmm. plants. And they decided against for the simple reason that while the Iraqi nuclear reactor had not gone critical, mm -hmm. so if you, when the Iraqi Israelis bombed that, it did not release any radiation. Mm -hmm. But Pakistani reactor had gone critical mm -hmm. and any Indian bombing would release uh, radiation, mm -hmm. but more significantly, that would open the way for Pakistanis to retaliate mm -hmm. and attack India's nuclear reactors near Bombay, mm -hmm. which would create absolute devastation. Mm -hmm. So the India looked at the consequences mm -hmm. and decided against. Mm -hmm. And the situation now is even worse because mm -hmm. you have much more facilities and much more nuclear material yeah. in store in Pakistan. So to go and bomb them mm -hmm. would basically start a, 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 a nuclear war between the two countries. Uh, one, one gets the, the sense that somehow these two discussions, one of, of uh, the aftermath of the Vietnam War and, and this situation are in, in a way uh, uh, both instructive in the same way about the the limits of the great power game uh, and uh, the the dead end that they lead us in terms of resolving uh, 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 conflicts within countries or regional conflicts uh, uh, so what does that tell us about how we will solve some of these problems, specifically this, this uh, conflict between Pakistan and India and South Asia? 
Yeah, I, I really have no answer to that. One, the question that, uh, the issue that uh, rises in my mind mm -hmm. is that both of these cases in India, Pakistan, and what happened in Cambodia, it shows the limits of power, yeah. of, of superpowers, mm -hmm. because their so-called clients have mind of their own, yeah. and they do things that the superpowers may not like, mm -hmm. but they have to live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. The Khmer Rouge were absolute rogue elements, and mm -hmm. what they did, Chinese were embarrassed later on, and they mm -hmm. couldn't control them, but Chinese built them in the same way as Pakistan has built Taliban. Mm -hmm. You know, and yet now China is joining up with the United States, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. saying the Taliban has been supporting and training some Islamic groups in China mm -hmm. who are uh, opposing and who want independence from China in uh, in Xinjiang province. Mm -hmm. Now, a, a theorist of international relations would say, uh, and, and uh, one theorist comes to mind, Kenneth Waltz, that, that regimes basically want to survive, mm -hmm. and so therefore they will not take that last step uh, uh, to nuclear war, and so therefore there can be a kind of stability mm -hmm. as both sides in a conflict get nuclear weapons. But I guess the, what, what the question that you're raising now in this discussion and the world is confronting is that when you have non-state actors mm -hmm. who are either uh, 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 religious cults or broad transnational movements that represent one strain in a religion, th there is a real danger here that we, I guess we really haven't thought through and, and we really don't know how to handle. Absolutely. I think the, the one the big difference that the situation now since September 11 uh, has made to the situ international situation is the, is the, uh, is the thought that in normally in any conflict the opposing side wants to kill each other but survive mm -hmm. in order to sever the victory, the fruits of the victory. Yeah. But when you have people who are willing to die, mm -hmm. they don't want to sever the victory themselves. Yeah. And that willingness to die creates a whole new dynamic. Mm -hmm. And that the world has to come to terms with, come to decide how to deal with that. And mm -hmm. that actually makes the threat of nuclear terrorism or bioterrorism much more severe because mm -hmm. people who are handling that, they are not afraid to die because they think they are going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And that fearlessness about one's own self-preservation mm -hmm. is has a totally different situation. Mm -hmm. So what, what is the role uh, and responsibility of an international journalist uh, confronting this kind of dy dynamic uh, in today's world? What, what, is, what is the special responsibility that you have in, in, in sort of uh, uh, telling the story and clarifying the issues? This is exactly that. I think we need to make people aware of the hopes, desires, fears, ambitions of people. I think the knowledge about different countries, cultures, history is critical in understanding why a conflict emerges and what can be done perhaps to even prevent it from coming to mm -hmm. a critical uh, situation when it cannot be stopped anymore. So I think the um, since the fall of Berlin Wall uh, there was this, uh, a decade has gone by where the world hasn't really tried, and at least developed countries haven't tried to understand what is uh, ticking, what is causing this all this ethnic nationalism, linguistic nationalism, why, what is pushing these people to do what they're doing. Uh, they're being treated as kind of symptoms, symptoms are being treated. You douse fire in somewhere and, and go home and another fire starts. Mm -hmm. But there is no long-term thinking mm -hmm. as to what could be the reason why all the small fires are breaking out here and there. And, and in a way, I, I read in what uh, the descriptions that you've just given us that in some way the chickens come home to roost yeah. uh, in a lot of these because what 
what a, what a great power Duke may do one day might come back to haunt it uh, the uh, next day, uh, as in the case of Afghanistan. Absolutely. Because even, even the Taliban, even the Mujahideen, their victory on the Russians, uh, one of the elements people say was critical was the supply of Stinger missiles. Mm -hmm. And about 90 Stingers never came back. Mm -hmm. And those Stingers are perhaps still some of them are operational mm -hmm. and pose deadly threat mm -hmm. to the aviation. One final question, what would be your advice to students uh, uh, as they prepare for the future, uh, maybe for journalism, but also to help them understand the, the world that they're going to confront? I think uh, area studies is absolutely very important. Mm -hmm. Understanding um, people, their history, and because a lot of people may not read history of their own country, but they carry on memories transmitted by previous generations. And they're trying to achieve something, have their ambition and, and anger. All this is fed by the past experience mm -hmm. and history. Uh, without understanding a country, its history, you are not going to understand what to do. And, and you're also suggesting your own history, mm -hmm. because some of these, uh, 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 th th that actually becomes critical mm -hmm. in understanding the history of other peoples. Yeah. yeah. Well, Nayan, ch thank you very much for joining us uh, for this conversation with history, and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.